be two different stories here, but this actually happened. So John and Mary, I, I was counseling them. They have a long-standing history of conflict in their marriage, and on one day as they are driving together, John asks Mary for $10 to go, go to the grocery store. Mary says, no, I will go tomorrow and buy all you need. An argument ensues. The car is stopped. The argument continues to rage on, and in the, in the anger, in the frustration, Mary steps out of the car to cool off. And at that moment in time, John hits the gas paddle, pedal, races off. Mary's purse is still in the car. Mary calls the police, and the husband ends up um, in the police department. I mean, like, how does it go from $10 to the husband, like, in jail? How does that happen? Um, and the police became involved there. So another couple, but I'm going to call them John and Mary as well. John and Mary text, so this is on like a Wednesday. We have Wednesday night ministry. So Mary texts John and asks if he needs her to serve alongside of him as discussed. So apparently Wednesday night they had, a, um, they had discussed serving together, but it was not a firm commitment. Um, so Mary says she's trying to plan ahead and get a few things done because the rest of the week is busy. John fires back in a text. It's always good to argue over text, isn't it? So John fires back. If you don't show up, this is on you. Don't make me look bad. They end up having a lengthy texting argument, and each accuses the other of not being a Christian anymore. So we start off with a simple serving question, and, and by the end, they're both going to hell. Like, what? <laughs> the original issue, one, in one thing it was $10, in another it was a scheduling issue. And one person ends up at the police station, and the other, and the other, they both end up in hell. How does this happen? Okay, you know, all of us have people in our lives, or maybe in your marriage, that seem to argue all the time. So, what's going on here? How can you begin to sort through the problems? If you're a counselor or a mentor, or maybe this is your marriage. Now, I'm going to distinguish in the discussion here between a problem and a conflict, because. Um, I have found that when I do it this way, it seems to help people. It may not with you, but we'll just see. We have problems all the time, but every problem does not produce a conflict. So um, every problem does not produce a conflict. Conflict between people normally starts with some kind of $10 need or a scheduling need. Conflict can ensue. It doesn't have to. So ultimately, the discussion is about how do we solve the problems of life, okay? So foundational understandings, all of this is in your notes, but understand the concept of what I'm defining as the troubles of life, the problem, something that causes uncertainty or difficulty um, between people and hardship in life. So, you know, what was the original issue in John and Mary's two episodes there? One the case was a $10 need for grocery. I don't originally know exactly what the $10 was for, but he needed something at the grocery store, a problem in life. In another case, it was a potential scheduling issue. And the lady in this case was thinking about her, her upcoming week, and she couldn't see how it was all fitting together. So it was a scheduling issue. So in each of these cases, the need at the grocery store and the scheduling issue presented a difficulty to John and Mary. So a real or perceived difficulty arises, and, um, and then, not always, but then a conflict can ensue. Now for the moment, um, think with me on this regard. There are infinite number of difficulties in life east of Eden. You know, resource limitations, financial needs, uh, time limitations, and that's what the wife was struggling with, time limitations. When you have unexpected things in your life, like the death of a loved one, a job loss, a car crash, child disobedience, a parenting moment, um, it's important for us to identify what really is the problem here? What's the need of the moment? So that we can bring back the attention on the problem, what is the need for the $10? How do I begin to solve the priority issue as well? Because God is working through those problems of life, and we need to see God at work. The, the counselor should, I know you're not counselors, but the counselor should understand why God allows problems in life. Let me ask you this. You should understand. Why does God allow problems in life? Don't look at your notes. Let's just ask this question here. 
So in Genesis 3, God allowed the world to be difficult. So east of Eden, now we're in the wilderness. East of Eden, cast out of the Garden of Delight, east of Eden. God has allowed the world to be difficult. There's resource limitations that we perceive, not with God, but, but that we perceive. There are priority issues. There is dust. There is struggles. Why did God allow this world to be so difficult under the curse? And here's why. To crowd us back to him. To crowd us back to Christ. To see our need so that we are pushed back to him. So it's precisely the limitations or the difficulties in this world through which we are pushed to Christ and God's work in our lives. Now, what's going on through problems of life? So pushing back us to dependence, but give me a variety of reason of what God does through the difficulties of life. Why? What is God doing through the difficulties of life? Give me a sum of the reasons he's pushing us and and what's happening through the problems of life. What would you say? Raise your hand, and I'll call on you. Why does God allow the problems of life to occur? Okay? So you can grow. Okay, so that I can grow. One reason, so that I can grow. Problems of life. Why else does God allow the problems of life? Oh, a testing of our faith. So in the, in the resource limitations. Um, how are we going to respond to grow, to test our faith? How else? What is God doing through the problems of life? Yes, sir, Josiah. Oh, so if there's a resource limitation that we perceive, you know, what am I going to do with my job loss or how am I going to function now? And God comes through to display his glory and his provision just in the right time. So to display God's glory and continue to increase our faith. What else is God doing through the problems of life? Yes, sir. Show to, to again, crowd me back to Christ to show that I'm dependent upon him. Yes. Oh, oh you had to say that, didn't you? <laughs> what he said was to expose our sin and our idols. And you got them all, I think, I pretty much that I listed here as well. So understand what God is doing through the problems of life. You didn't get this one, but um, the first one that I put, because I start back in Genesis, providing opportunities to advance the creation mandates. Um, God started Adam and Eve in the garden, and as I mentioned to you, that the God started with Adam and Eve. Their purpose was to be the visible representation of the invisible God. So as they multiplied, they would increase the image of God throughout the entire um, earth so that the glory of God would fill throughout the entire earth. But as the Garden of Eden expanded, uh, here's how I envisioned the earth in the beginning. The Garden of Eden was not all over the landmass. It was in one location, and they were to expand its boundaries and exercise dominion over the earth. And in order to do that, they had to build infrastructure. They would have to tend to the garden so that the garden would expand throughout the entire earth. And that requires infrastructure. So providing, oppor quite, providing opportunities through the problems to advance the creation mandate for the thriving of humanity in a more secular sense, but still entirely necessary, the most important job in the city. What is the most important job here in the city? The most important job in the city here? Trash collector or and sewer. I, I, you don't think about that? And then the water as well, so that the humanity can thrive. So problems... When we, have, when we need the sewer system extended to the suburb or whatever so that humanity can thrive problems, resource limitations, the thriving of humanity, providing opportunities to advance the creation mandate. Number two, providing opportunities also for justice and righteousness. So east of Eden, there is injustice. East of Eden, there's unrighteousness. There's problems that come to us, and as pastors, we have to solve problems and exercise justice and righteousness. In your marriage, your children are unjust. Your spouse may be unjust, and it's opportunity for us to display righteousness and justice and equity as well. Number three, providing the mechanism through which our idolatry is exposed, which this young man said as well. So 
when there are bacon limitations or other limitations, your what is in you surfaces. Classic Paul Tripp illustration. Okay? So what happens to me? So if I shake this, okay, a little bit of water. I know, it's, it's almost an offense to the, to, the, the, to the sanctuary here, but you did say I could bring water in here. Um, <laughs> you did. <laughs> um, why, why did water come out of the bottle? Tell me, why did water come out of the bottle? You've heard the Paul Tripp illustration. So many times people, well, Brent, you shook the bottle. Okay, well, when we're shaken, when we're shaken, what comes out is what's in us. When I was shaken with um, the dissertation last night and then um, no bacon, what came out of me, my unkindness, was already in me. So the point being here is providing the mechanism through which our idolatry is exposed and then providing the opportunity, which one of you said, for faith to work itself out in the believer's life. Um, and then as we do that also, to provide the opportunity for God to work for his glory so through my humble dependence, um, you know, and many of you can test to this, you know, you have a need and then you pray and then you see God's miraculous answers. Not all of us have that, but um, some of us have seen those things over time as we pray. And number six, just recognize this, the ultimate problem. What is the ultimate problem? Our ultimate limitation our ultimate need where we could not bridge the gap, where we could not cover ourselves, the ultimate problem God himself solved. Our ultimate problem is sin and our desperate um, um, heart issue that God is solving for us. So the ultimate difficulty of our sin problem, which God has worked through his glory in Jesus Christ. So um, tell me this. Okay, don't look at your notes. What's the difference between a problem and a conflict? What's the difference between a problem and a conflict? Maybe it's obvious. What's the difference between a problem and a conflict? A problem, okay, well, hold on, Pastor Chris, I'm gonna pick on you. <laughs> The problem makes me collide. Why do you do what you do, Pastor Chris? Why do you do what you do? Because she made me. Because she made me. <laughs> According to Pastor Chris, I do what I do because a problem made me do it. <laughs> Are you getting this? <laughs> oh, so uh, I do what I do because I want what I want, always, always, always. But what's the difference between a problem and a conflict? Uh, a problem can lead to a conflict. Okay. But a, a conflict is, a, a conflict comes for one reason. And it may be over a problem, but a conflict always, 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 if you will, please say always. always. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you is not the source, the problems of your life? No, the pleasures that wage war in your members. A conflict comes because of your idolatry, not because of the problems in life. Water came out because water was in. It was not because I was shaking the bottle. As we don't get that. You have conflicts, which tension, hostility in relationships, throwing the other one under the bus, only for one reason, because of what is in you. Okay, so distinguishing, understand the difference between a problem and a conflict. Problems. Problems are the limitations of life, the difficulties of life, uh, the need. Um, but conflict over the problem only, only, only arise when one or both is operating out of an earthly value system. We don't need to turn in to James again and read that. I just quoted to you. But um, so the problem results in some kind of perception of deficiency in me or um, I start, my, my spouse's solution is not my solution and I want my way to win. And at that moment in time when I elevate myself, my life for me, my way for me is when the conflict comes. So the idolatrous earthly value systems 
That's a, what is that? I'm living for the things of the earth. Manifest themselves in fairly typical response patterns to the problem. You know, some of us um, escape or retreat or ignore. So I don't want to deal with issues. I don't want to deal with the, pri the scheduling issues. I don't want to deal with the conflict issues. So I will escape or I will retreat or I will ignore and internalize my anger over time. Eventually, that'll come out in some way. Okay, you, can, you can stuff and stuff and stuff for a long time, but eventually when the, the problems continue to build, then attack or blame. It's the woman that you gave me. Where is the bacon, honey? Here is what is not happening most of the time. Rarely is energy directed toward creative problem solutions to the original problem. So the grocery need, the $10 for John and Mary went unmet. The scheduling issue was dropped and they just got bitter and they never actually solved that problem. If Satan can keep us fighting, then we don't advance the creation mandate of exercising dominion and we don't build infrastructures and get out there for the thriving of humanity and making decisions for justice and equity and righteousness because we're sit sitting there fighting. Perpetual conflict over problems or, um, or the inability to solve even minor issues, bacon, okay? or $10 for groceries, or what are we doing tonight, Wednesday night for serving, indicate something like this, ingrained patterns. Jan and I talked about the patterns in the previous testimony there. So, and I'm going to say this one more time. One of the most freeing and helpful concepts that has been, um, for Jan and I, has been understanding what I talked to you about last night on the heart. Can I exhort you to study that more and more? You know, when I was first discipled, my discipler taught me, I told you about him, about the spiritual disciplines. And that really is all that he knew to teach me because that's what he knew. So I knew about the spiritual disciplines, but I did not know about my worry, my fear, my anxiety, my depression. He could not help me with that young man's depression. And even when I went to Purdue, and um, I was the little fish in the big pond at Purdue, and I was struggling with depression. I called my navigator friend, and he didn't have, just as he did not have answers back then at Oklahoma State, he didn't have answers when I called him. So, um, so I did not understand what all of the fruit in my life was coming from. So I needed to understand more and more about the hearts. Now, I have come to the conclusion that, and you'll have to too, that we don't have myriads of issues. We have one issue, and that's the root issue of we're all idolaters, and the very greatest commandment, we love other things other than God. And when we perceive those other things as threatened, that's when we have conflict, okay? And the root issue is I'm not loving God in the midst of those moments. And we all have patterns of how we love other things other than God. So let me give you just a snippet of John and Mary here. So I gave you John and Mary's presentation problem, but let me, show, let me tell you a little bit more that may help you understand why they are responding that way. Not just because they're jerks right now, but they are. But here is the history, a bit of the history. So John grew up in a past where his parents were always critical always harshly critical. John could never do anything correctly. He began to find his refuge from his parents' lack of compassion in just attempting to please people, so a fear of man issue. Although he was not aware of his pattern, he was always striving to be amazing to people and wanting people to recognize he was significant and important. Mary, on the other hand, grew up in an abusive past. She responded to her abuse, as many do, by closing off and not trusting people for fear she may get hurt. Although she did not recognize it, she lived for security and attempts to control situation so she can be safe. When she feels like there may not be safety, she becomes cold, harsh, and critical. So think with me on this. John asked for money. 
Mary just says, no, I will get it. John also had a history of buying lottery tickets at the grocery store. Just notice that as well. John demands the money. Mary starts to criticize John. And he has a, he grew up in a place where he was always criticized. John's amazingness is threatened. Mary then, her security is threatened at that moment in time. So Mary gets out of the car to cool off. And John acts amazingly by speeding off with her purse. <laughs> you know, and, and then think through this. So Mary texts John about scheduling. She says, you know, what about I not come tonight? And if John is a people pleaser, and that's where his identity is found, John is fearful that tonight at children's ministry, he, he's responsible for his wife, and his wife doesn't show up. John is fearful that he might not look good in the serving opportunity if he says his wife had to stay home, and he's the only one there. John fires a sarcastic text back. Well, if you don't show up, that's on you. Mary doesn't feel safe, so she closes off and becomes critical herself. They argue and share unkind words and accuse one another of not being a believer. And they show up in your office wanting you to disciple the other one, fix, fix them. <laughs> and that's where they come to your office. They come to you and say, my husband is the problem, my wife is the problem. So these are ingrained patterns that result in the inability to solve even the minor problems of life. And that results also in a metastasized, sometimes cancer of bitterness. And we don't recognize it, and maybe we're just stubbornly repentant as well. Um, hardened positions claim, sometimes hardened positions of idolatry can also be claimed as biblical convictions as well. For example, like this a pastor who neglects his family, but he says, I am called into the ministry. And he abuses, not abuses in a physical sense, but constantly oppresses his wife and never giving priority to his family because he is called. Or a husband who couches his wife's concerns in biblical language as a lack of submission, when in reality he is living for ease and want, not wanting to lead and... Uh, um, she is wondering why he won't do certain things, and he just says, lady, you're not submitting to me. He couches his idolatry, sometimes even in biblical bullying, okay? Patterns of idolatry. Couples all come to you many times, or you may be in this situation. Here's what couples perceive as the problem. Rarely do individuals bring, the counts, bring to the counselor the actual problem. Nobody has come to me and said, hey, this was the $10 problem. Will you help us to solve what to do with the $10 problem? They don't tell me that. They come and say, they recouch the problem in terms of fix my wife, fix my husband. Okay? Blame shifting and self-justification and all of that is an act of covering. Covering from Genesis chapter 3. We cover our brokenness. Now, let me show you a couple here. I got a video here that I want to show you. So this is Jordan M. Uh, Jordan was a seminary student in our last cohort. And um, I, we had the, Jan and I had the privilege of working with Jordan M. And um, they struggled with perpetual arguing. And um, so listen to their story. I got three videos. So I'm going to play it. Then we're going to talk about how to help them play a video of how they were helped and then see also the conclusion of their story as well so uh, guys are you ready for this uh, okay you're ready so I'm going to bring up the video hi my name is Jordan Britt and this is my wife Em during my time at Faith as a pastoral intern and seminary student we needed some extra help in our marriage we sought marriage counseling because we were having trouble solving problems together without bickering. The little everyday decisions that we needed to make as a married couple turned into drawn out arguments where both of us struggled to understand each other and ultimately fought to be heard rather than to listen and learn where the other person was coming from. Before counseling, the typical pattern of how our conflicts usually went began with a problem. A problem doesn't start out as a conflict necessarily. Rather, a problem is something that caused uncertainty, difficulty, or hardship. 
when faced with scheduling conflicts, miscommunications, or budgeting decisions, rather than working together as a team, we struggle to see past our own interests. We made the situation more about gratifying our fleshly desires. In these moments, my prideful fear of man and desire for approval from others typically manifested in passive aggression or immediate verbal self-defense when I felt disrespected or looked down on. At the same time, my pride in wanting to control and ease typically manifested in anger or unkind speech when I felt inconvenienced. While each conflict typically started small, they grew once neither of us felt like our side was understood and neither of us were ready to humble ourselves. Ultimately, neither of us believed the best in the other person and felt like we could not go on until we got what we wanted. My heart was saying, we cannot solve this problem until I feel loved and respected. And my heart was saying, we cannot solve this problem until I feel assured that I will have ease. One of the conflicts we faced together in counseling was the issue of forgetting our car. Our small group met close to the church campus where M worked, but our apartment was 20 minutes away. Sometimes we would meet at the church and ride together with the intention of stopping by the church on our way home to get the other car. On one of the days when I suggested that we ride together, M, after having a long day and knowing small group would get out late, said, yes, but we have to remember to get my car on our way home. I agreed and we went to small group. After small group, we began to drive straight home and it wasn't until we were almost home that I noticed and said, we forgot the car. We both knew in that moment that we had to turn around because we would be driving in separate directions in the morning. This problem could be solved without sinning, but both of us gave into our idols immediately. My first response was to say, we cannot keep letting this happen. And my response was to remain silent until preparing a defense and responding with, well, it's not like this is a pattern. Neither of us were considering the other person and seeking to solve the problem. In my pride, I was offended because I had lost control of a situation in which the best case scenario in my mind would have been to remember the car and save us from the inconvenience so that we could get home in time to rest for the next day. I wanted the gratification of knowing that this inconvenience would never happen again. In my pride, I realized that I had made a mistake that would cost both of us hardship. When I realized that M was upset, I wanted understanding that my mistake was not that bad and that I was still deserving of respect. Rather than working together to find a solution to the issue of forgetting the car, the conflict escalated as we both were operating out of our selfish desires. All right. We cannot let this inconvenience ever happen again. <laughs> How are you going to make that happen? So um, do inconveniences occur on schedule? <laughs> no. And when um, M said all this, said, said this as well, um, we cannot keep letting this happen. What was implied in that, Jordan, you need to not let this happen again. So, guys, we all have these things. So whether it's bacon, whether it's the $10 for grocery need, whether it's um, a scheduling thing, whether it's a parked car, we have these things. So now tell me this. Let's think through with logic. We have the Bible. Yes, we have the Bible. We can go to Bible principles, but you help me right now. What is good to so How do we help people? How do we help ourselves solve the problems of life without conflict? Or if there is conflict, what do I do? So you just think through logically. Now that you know what is a problem, what is a conflict? Tell me some steps without looking at your notes of how we solve problems and build unity rather than conflict. What would be a good first step? What would be a good first step? This is where you talk now. Raise your hand. What would you do? Okay, the moment that I am considering my own desires, the moment that I am feeling the tension rise, the moment that I am sensing um, anger, defensiveness, 
me starting to attack or blame. At that moment, what should I do? Ask the question, what am I wanting? What am I wanting? Okay, the moment that those things, because the emotions, the anger, the guilt, the shame, the anxiety, the tension that I'm feeling, the emotions are windows into what again? Emotions are windows into what? My worship. So what am I loving the most right now? Is it me getting my way? Is it me getting what I want out of this particular difficulty? Is it going to be solved my way? Um, what is the need of the moment and how am I going to get it my way? Okay. Anything else that I should be doing at this moment in time? What? Oh, absolutely. Being praying. What will praying do for me? What will praying do for me at that moment? I know that's... <laughs> you were giving me an answer and I put it back on you so you don't have... I'm not just pointing you out. What will praying do for me? It reshifts our focus. It can reshift our focus. Get my eyes off of my life for me and if I pray to God... I draw near to God and see the choreography of heaven in my life for you. And in that, in that specific way, I can begin to see more clearly how to solve a problem. What else should I be doing in conflict resolution? Janet. In that moment, what's, what I need to do is remember God's providence, that God's the one ultimately, not you. It's God that allowed this. So why did the parking, why did I leave the car there? Well, maybe I'm stupid, but why did God allow me to do that? Because God is working through the problems. Remember all the things you said about the problems? Why does God allow us to have problems? The first six things there? I need to remember all of those things as well. So with that in mind, notice. So initial help for problem solving here. Non-emergency problems can be delayed until teaching is performed. I, you know, I'm, this is from a counselor's perspective. Okay, so this lecture was given for the, one of the counseling conferences as well. So, um, so I'm giving it in context of a counselor. Teaching um, things like the problems, what God is doing through problems. Teaching what God is doing in the heart and exposing it as well. So this is why I spent time teaching you first about these things. Emergency problems should be dealt with by allowing the most responsible before God to decide in consultation with spiritual authorities. If the most responsible in this case is an oppressive husband, emergency problems, um, I am not saying that person should be responsible for deciding on emergency problems, but um, spiritual authorities in your life with known oppressive husbands um, we need to be very careful in letting them decide, pastors, because they will decide many times if they are not repentant in their own self-interest. So with that caveat, in general, emergency problems should be dealt with by allowing the most responsible before God to decide. Now, attempt. Here's what we need to remember, because in the midst of a conflict, there are three strands of prop conflict. In the midst of a conflict, Here's what's going on. Number one, heart issues creating the conflict. Okay? So in the midst of a conflict, here is what will be going on. Wherever there is quarrels and conflicts among us is not the source of pleasure. So one or both of you in the conflict is having idolatrous heart issues over whatever is the need of the moment. What is the need of the moment? Number two or number three? Structural needs for life's processes, decision-making, management, living. So those things, the number two and three are the problems of life. Number one is the heart issue creating the conflict over the problems of life. These things will be present in a conflict. $10, structural needs in life, time issues, the car left at the church, those are needs in life over which, number one, the heart issue com combined with those are creating the conflict. And then a counselor or pastor, again, this is from a counselor pastor perspective, my job would be to teach the individuals what is God doing through the problems of life. So all the things that we mentioned in one through six above teach what God is doing through those problems and then number two, teach the goal when problems arise. The goal, let me ask you this question. Is the goal to solve the problem? This is a trick question. Is the goal to solve the problem? Tell me what, is the goal to solve the problem, yes or no? 
Oh, you're very good. You're, you got my trick question. What's the goal in life? Um, let me ask it this way. What's your purpose? <laughs> What's your purpose? You know your purpose. What is your purpose? I am the visible representation of the invisible God. I may or may not can actually solve the problem, but I can live out my goal. I can manifest God's value system to my spouse. I could live the choreography of heaven to my spouse. And that puts me in the best possible position to solve the problem. But I may not can actually solve the problem. So, um, help individuals um, of teaching them the goal. To please God by becoming more like Christ. By practicing faith in God that results in love for others. And if possible, if possible, to solve the difficulty in a way that promotes justice and righteous and equity certainly considers the other person, the choreography of heaven, my life for yours. Right? As a counselor and as a pastor, I will be teaching married couples to identify also the, so we got the goal, and then I'm going to help them to understand what's hindering them from the goal, which is their own my life for me. So this is what I'm going to be teaching people. If you're in the midst of a conflict, you need to be recognizing what's going on in your own life. Help individuals to identify and repent of their natural response patterns which create the conflict. Here are a bunch of um, resources that I would recommend for you just to, I've exhorted you over and over on the heart. So Gospel Treason by Brad Bigney. Uh, ladies, Elise Fitzpatrick on Idols of the Heart, Tim Keller. Counterfeit Gods, Paul Tripp, War of Words. My wife is reading now another of Paul Tripp's book, books, which is not on here, but we were just discussing it on the way up here. Um, relationships, a mess worth making. And um, we were, she was reading some excerpts from that that is saying the same thing that we're saying here as well. So I would encourage that book as well, Relationships, a mess worth making. And I think the origin of it was when Paul Tripp and Tim Lane were working together and they couldn't get along. And so they wrote a book together about this. Imagine that. And they ended up getting, so Tim Lane and Paul Tripp are the author of Relationships, a mess worth making. Paul Tripp's DVDs. Uh, what did you expect? I use these for marriage counseling, pre-marriage counseling on a regular basis and my own Heart of Change videos. Those videos, again, made uh, about 20 years ago. They're free um, resource for you there at the uh, link that you see there. You'll notice 20 years ago, well, 20 years ago, I was a lot younger, so you'll notice that, but um, 20 years ago, I also was not as gospel-centered as I am now. So if you listen to those videos, you won't hear uh, the, the, the way that I unpacked the gospel, because I've learned from other people over the years. One of them is Tim Keller is listening to his sermons. So many of my gospel um, treatments I've heard somehow from Tim Keller in some way when he preaches. But you'll see that's more part of my ministry now than it was 20 years ago. With those things in place, teach how righteous communication looks. Those of you who have been to the Biblical Counseling Conference, we have a lecture called Biblical Communication. And here are the four principles. When I communicate, I need to remember this. Be honest. Keep current. Attack the problem and not the person. And act, don't react. And I'm saying to you this. My first thing in teaching is not, you must follow these principles. I teach the principles after I teach on the heart. Okay? Why might that be a logical scenario? Teach what's going on in the heart first before I teach on the principles of communication. Because I could just come to you and say, this is the way you should communicate. So, okay, for your conflict resolution, you guys, husband and wife, should go home and um, sit together and you practice the rules of communication. Be honest, keep current, attack the problem, not the person, and act and don't react. And I'm going to make sure that you do these rules. Now, I must say, there's, there's not, the rules are biblical. The principles are biblical. But what's the problem of teaching the rules without teaching on the heart? What might be the problem? What might be the problem? What danger do you see that? I'm addressing the fruit instead of the roots. Okay. 
Um, I, and I, if you send somebody home, we we'll just say, do it this way. They may be able to do it for a while, but if we do what we do because we want what we want, if I'm not wanting God, why would I want his rules? If I'm not wanting God, why would I want his rules? When I'm delighted with God, then I recognize the best way to communicate is to be honest by speaking the truth in love. So when I'm delighting in God, the four rules of communication will come out more easily and naturally to me. Okay? So teach them on that regard after I've t taught them on um, something before. Let me say if number five for just a moment. So now I'm going to show you Here's what Em and Jordan learned in counseling. So let me play that for us now. So video number two. Okay. First, we focused on understanding my own heart at a deeper level. I knew I sinned, but didn't understand what I was clamoring after and why. I only knew that in situations where I felt like my desired reputation was in jeopardy, I responded simply. I learned that this was due to me living to exalt myself rather than God. This is blinding idolatry. Also, Brent and Janet had me listen to Janet's lecture on unfulfilled longings. This lesson was about the disappointment that comes from seeking to have the things of this earth, even good things, try to satisfy us, like relationships. Prior to marriage, I was struggling with loneliness, so it was tempting for me to put all my stock in how others perceived me. I thought that if people saw me as a pleasant person, then they would give me their love and appreciation. I brought this into my marriage, so anytime I felt like M didn't appreciate me, I clamored for it even more. I was less concerned about loving and serving my wife, and more concerned with her believing that I'm a great husband. We had both previously watched the Heart of Change videos while attending Faith Church. These truths were foundational in understanding that we do what we do because we want what we want, and we want what we want because of the idols at war within us. In addition, what helped me to see and understand my worship patterns was a series of x-ray questions written by the late David Powelson. After answering 35 questions that penetrated to my heart's treasures, it was readily apparent that what I was wanting most of all was control so that I might avoid as much hardship as possible and gain as much ease as I desired. Then we focused specifically on thinking through how Jesus is better than anything we desire on this earth. I learned to see Jesus as better than the fleeting pleasures of the approval of others. Jesus was despised and rejected by men, and, and because of this, I was saved. Christ's pressing into human rejection is precisely why I was saved. How can I love the approval of others more than the one who loved me like this? For me, I thought I needed control of the situation for everything to be easy and comfortable. I thought I needed Jordan to agree with me at all times, to love me unconditionally, and to see my way as right. But Jesus doesn't promise us that these things will satisfy. What he promises is that God is always in control, that he loves me completely and is working all things for our good, and that I wasn't always right. These truths allow me to be freed up from the pressure of always making everything perfect. Instead, I could see problems as an opportunity to love and serve Jordan. When I'm trusting God, I am free to be a re better representation of his son to my husband, especially when he is hurting. One of the most helpful homework assignments given to us in counseling was a BCTC lecture titled, Helping Couples Solve Problems. From this lecture, we learned that problems do not have to escalate into conflicts. Problems are anything that cause difficulty or hardship. They present opportunities for us to grow in Christ's likeness. These problems were escalating because of our sinful desires. So once we began to remove the idols from our eyes, we were able to see our problems more clearly and work together to solve them, as we were designed to. I was also able to see the disorder in my life more clearly by answering questions like, what does my idol offer me and what does it actually give me? 
and comparing that to what God offers and gives me. Sin always overpromises and underdelivers, but God is always faithful to keep his promises. So this assignment helped me to see that more clearly. The last step in growing in our conflict resolution was to craft a repentance plan from what we had learned about our own hearts. Mine was something like this. Instead of delighting in the praise and approval of others, manifesting anger and bitterness when feeling lonely or disrespected, I will see that God is more delightful and that he is all that I need. And although I am not worthy, he judges me as righteous through Christ's work, which will manifest in me greater contentment and a humble spirit ready to receive criticism. We both developed these plans and began reviewing them before starting the day and before coming home to be best prepared to interact lovingly. For me, the actual task of writing the repentance plan was just as helpful as reviewing it daily. Having this homework assignment forced me to stop and think about what I was committing to. I was admitting that my sinful idols were worthless and that God's way is better. I had to apply principles I learned in counseling knowing I am secure in my identity in Christ, that my job is to please Christ, even if I don't look amazing to others, to my idols, knowing I would be reviewing this regularly and often. All right, turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Ephesians 4, 22. You probably have certainly been exposed to this before. This is the classic put off and put on passage. This is not precisely in your notes, I'm just adding this, so you get this free of charge. This was not included in the registration fee, so Ephesians 4, let me get there as well, verse 22, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, notice what is being corrupted by, which is corrupted in accordance with lust of deceit. We do what we do because we, and our former manner of life is consisting of chasing after all of the earthly pleasures and treasures. Notice what Jordan's, Jordan's, he said at the end he developed a repentance plan. So Janet and I led them to develop a repentance plan. What that repentance plan is, him recognizing the patterns of his heart. Jordan's patterns was instead of delighting in the praise of man, resulting in anger, withdrawal when I don't get it. Okay, so let's go back here to something, the diagram of the heart. Here it is. Okay, so here's what I was doing with Jordan. Instead of delighting in the praise of man, resulting in anger when I don't get my wife's respect. Okay. So what I was having him do is recognize the root and he also withdrew, so his actions, his withdrawing, and his emotional state, anger. So I was having him identify his root with the outward behaviors and the outward anger as well, the windows into his worship. You got it there. That's put off. Okay, that's put off. Okay. How did Jordan renew his mind? And I will, I don't know if you caught it. It was pretty subtle. Look at verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay. Did you catch what he said there? If you didn't, he said something like this. I will think about Jesus who was not pursuing the praise of man but left the ease of heaven so that he could come down regardless of what men thought of him. And because of that, because of that, I was saved. What is that? A greater delight. Helping Jordan focus on the gospel. And therefore, put on, look at verse 24. And put on the new self. Therefore, I will delight in God alone, created in righteousness and in truth. Okay. Um, so I will, 
delight in God and I will engage in the problem solving. There was Jordan's repentance plan because that was his pattern of life which he was struggling with and he had to develop that and M developed hers as well. And then we would begin to also, this is something else that uh, we did with them that he did not mention there. He'll mention it in the last video that I'll show you. Teach helpful communication structures as well. Let me mention this one and then I'll show you the last video and we'll be done. But other structures that promote a safe place to pull aside and just talk. So a safe place, not in the middle of a conflict, but a planned time where we're where I instruct the couple to plan like 20 minutes, maybe once, maybe twice a week, and have a structured time to communicate. Things like this. If I have taught them, if I have taught them these things, to look at their heart first, okay? So uh, two to three times a week, 20 minutes, a planned time, so each one knows that they're going to have time to discuss things. And it won't be in the heat of the moment, it won't be on the fly when you don't have one another's attention, but the husband would lead in prayer. So he would start in prayer. The husband tells the wife of ways he has seen God at work in her life. So it starts with the husband encouraging. Here's how I've seen. Here's how I've seen God work in your life. Thank you for that. The wife tells the husband of ways she has seen God at work in his life. Honey, here's the ways I've seen God uh, work in your life. And uh, thank you for uh, not uh, criticizing the meal this time over bacon, a lack of bacon. Thank you for... Um, just being thankful, husband. Number four, if I have done my work as a counselor to help the husband identify um, his own issues, he should be readily able to identify, oh dear, oh dear, I was, I was operating under my pursuit of ease and comfort this week when I did this, and that affected you. So the husband tells the wife of ways he has seen himself fall short. And if he has sinned, um, he confesses those sin, examples of sin and sinful worship patterns that he has seen in his own life. Okay? And then wife tells the husband of ways she has seen herself fallen short. If I'm teaching her the same thing. Okay? Now, number six and number seven is where this could go awry. If, if the husband and the wife are not really repentant, if they're not really humbled, this is where they start attacking one another. And when I have tried to apply this too early before teaching, it doesn't go well because it's not a safe place. But the husband, the husband asks this, like, I'm Brent, that Janet. Janet, have you seen any additional concerns in me this week? Now, again, if, if the husband is not ready to hear because he's not humbled, this is where it can go awry. If the wife is not humble in the way that she shares the concern, this is where it can go awry. And if I sign it too early, many times the couple comes back and says, the conference table or the communication structure did not work because we began to beat each other up at this moment in time. It doesn't become a safe place, right? But when they're truly repentant and learning, this becomes a sweet time of learning to help one another. Um, number eight, then we're able to solve the problems of life. And notice, the problems in life like $10. The problems in life like, um, like a scheduling priority are kind of last on the list, but they can be minor things. Sometimes they can be major, but it's only after I get the log out of my own eye that I can see clearly what is the need of the moment. So the husband leads to discuss any scheduling issue, resource limitations, problems that need to be addressed. And at this moment in time, in number eight, can we actually become one flesh in solving creatively those problems without all of the blinding idolatry? And over time, this becomes ingrained in us. And we can move out in life and handle the original creation mandate to um, um, take dominion over this earth from a team standpoint. And then the husband closes in prayer. All right, let's see how M and Jordan are actually doing now. Video segment number three on which we will close. Well, how are we doing now? It's not a magical, everything is fixed, sit back and relax kind of situation. Growth in righteousness takes ongoing effort. We are maintaining some of the disciplines we learned in counseling. 
We do a weekly debrief with each other, which gives us an opportunity to confess and repent of sin in an unemotional setting and to ask if there's any sins we missed and to encourage each other in how we have seen the other grow in the past seven days. While we still struggle and will not be perfected until Christ returns, we more consistently view the problems and hardships of life as opportunities to grow in Christ's likeness. The problems do not need to become conflicts. We are more readily able to recognize how problems become conflicts and then get to confession and repentance much more quickly. And this has reduced the number of conflicts we have. We're able to engage the problems of life in a more unified way. Our marriage has become a safer place for sin to be exposed, and we have been able to come alongside each other and grow. Overall, life together now is even sweeter. And we are able to launch out together and advance God's ministry purposes for us in our community. One of the greatest benefits of counseling was not only learning to solve problems in our own marriage, but having the tools we need to equip others to do the same. I have had the opportunity to use what God has taught me in every one of my spheres of influence. Women in my adult small group, girls in my middle school small group, and in both formal and informal discipleship settings. I recently completed my ACBC certification and through this process have been given the opportunity to counsel others. Most recently, Em and I met a new couple who was struggling with very similar issues to what we needed counseling for. It was humbling to hear them speak about their struggles because we could very easily empathize with them based on our own struggles. Em even joined us for a couple of sessions and we each got to pour into this couple to help them see their own sinful patterns and encourage them with the hope of how we have seen the gospel transform our marriage. We're so thankful to have learned these truths in the beginning of our marriage because now we have the rest of our lives to serve each other and point others to God. All right, All right. Jordan, M. Jordan is a worship pastor in Iowa and them is doing well. They're doing well. So thankful for God's work in their life. All right, we're, um, here's what I want us to do now. We've got a break until 11.20. 11.20. 11.20, the men stay in the refreshment room. Okay, we're, we're going to talk about fun topics, sex. Okay, the ladies will come right back here at 11.20 with my wife. Men stay in the refreshment room at 11.20. We'll have one more session, and then we'll come back here after that for a time of Q&A and um, then closing out as well. So take a break. And 1120B in your designated location. Thanks for your good attention so far. <laughs> Bacon and sex. <laughs> <laughs> 